Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to the Bearded Book Club's production of The Color of Magic by Terry Pratchett. If you want to follow along in this and all of our productions, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so you will be notified of all new videos as well as when we do our live shows. If you would like to support Bearded Book Club, you could do so in two ways, both of which are listed in this video's description. Number one, you could become a patron and support us on a regular basis. Or number two, you can go to our Amazon wish list and send us a book as a one-time donation. So without further ado, let us continue. The days passed peacefully. True, a small band of bridge trolls tried to ambush them on one occasion, and a party of brigands nearly caught them unawares one night, but unwisely tried to investigate the luggage before slaughtering the sleepers. Hrun demanded and got double pay for both occasions. If any harm comes to us, said Rincewind, then there will be no one to operate the magic box. No more pictures of Hrun, you understand. Hrun nodded, his eyes fixed on the latest picture. It showed Hrun striking a heroic pose with one foot on a heap of slain trolls. Me and you and little friend Two Flowers, we all get on okay, he said. Also tomorrow, may we get a better profile, okay? He carefully wrapped the picture in troll skin and stowed it in his saddlebag along with the others. It seems to be working, said Two Flower admiringly as Hrun rode ahead to scout the road. Sure, said Rincewind, what heroes like best is themselves. You're getting quite good at using the picture box, you know that? Yar. So you might like to have this, Two Flower held out a picture. What is it? asked Rincewind. Oh, just the picture you took in the temple. Rincewind looked in horror. There, bordered by a few glimpses of tentacle, was a huge, world, calloused, potion-stained, and unfocused thumb. That's the story of my life, he said wearily. You win, said Fate, pushing the heap of souls across the gaming table. The assembled gods relax. There will be other games, he added. The lady smiled into two eyes that were like holes in the universe. And then there was nothing but the ruin of the forest and a cloud of dust on the horizon, which drifted away on the breeze. And sitting on a pitted and moss-grown milestone, a black and ragged, raggedy figure. His was the air of one who is unjustly put upon, who is dreaded and feared, yet who is the only friend of the poor and the best doctor for the mortally wounded. Death, although of course completely eyeless, watched Rincewind disappearing with what would, had his face possessed any mobility at all, had been a frown. Death, although exceptionally busy at all times, decided that he now had a hobby. There was something about the wizard that irked him beyond measure. He didn't keep appointments, for one thing. I'll get you, Cully, said Death in the voice like the slamming of leaden coffin lids. See if I don't. It was called the Wormberg, and it rose almost one half of a mile above the Green Valley, a mountain huge, gray, and upside down. <clears throat> At its base, it was a mere score of yards across. Then it rose through clinging clouds, curving gracefully outwards like an upturned trumpet until it was truncated by a plateau fully a quarter of a mile across. There was a tiny forest up there, its greenery cascading over the lip. There was buildings. Uh, there was even a small river, tumbling down over the edge in a waterfall so wind-whipped that it reached the ground as rain. There was also a number of cave mouths a few yards below the plateau. They had a crudely carved regular look about them, so that on this crisp autumn morning the Wormberg hung over the clouds like a giant dove coat. This would mean that the doves had a wingspan slightly in excess of forty yards. I knew it, said Rincewind. We're in a strong magical field. Two Flower and Hrun looked around the little hollow where they had made their noonday halt. Then they looked at each other. The horses were quietly cropping the rich grass by the stream. Yellow butterflies skittered among the bushes. There was a smell of thyme and a buzzing of bees. The wild pigs on the spit sizzled gently. Hrun shrugged and went back to oiling his biceps. They gleamed. Looks all right to me, he said. Try tossing a coin, said Rincewind. What? Go on, toss a coin. Okay, said Hrun, if it gives you any pleasure. 
He reached into his pouch and withdrew a handful of loose change plundered from a dozen realms. With some care, he selected a schlotty, leaden quarter I iodum and balanced it on a purple thumbnail. You call, he said, heads or... He inspected the obverse with an air of intense concentration. Some sort of a fish with legs. When it's in the air, said Rincewin. Frun grinned and flicked his thumb. The iodum rose, spinning. Edge, said Rincewin without looking at it. Magic never dies. It merely fades away. Nowhere was this more evident on the wide blue expanse of the Discworld than in those areas that had been the scene of the great battles of the Mage Wars which had happened very shortly after creation. In those days, magic in its raw state had been wildly available and had been eagerly utilized by the first men in their war against the gods. The precise origin of the mage wars had been lost in the fogs of time, but disc philosophers agree that the first men, shortly after their creation, understandably lost their temper, and great and pyrotechnic were the battles that followed. The sun wheeled across the sky, the seas boiled, weird storms ravaged the land. Small white pigeons mysteriously appeared in people's clothing, and the very stability of the disc, carried as it was through the space on the backs of four giant turtle-riding elephants, was threatened. This resulted in stern action by the old high ones, to whom even the gods themselves are answerable. The gods were banished to high places, Men were recreated a good deal smaller, and much of the old wild magic was sucked out of the earth. That did not solve the problem of those places on the disc which, during the wars, had suffered a direct hit by a spell. The magic faded away, slowly over the millennia, releasing as it decayed myriads of sub-astral particles that severely distorted the reality around it. Rincewind, Two Flower, and Hrun stared at the coin. Edge it is, said Hrun. Well, you're a wizard, so what? I don't do that sort of spell. You mean you can't? Rincewind ignored this because it was true. Try it again, he suggested. Hrun pulled out a fistful of coins. The first landed in the usual manner, so did the fourth. The third landed on its edge and balanced there. The fifth turned into a small yellow caterpillar and crawled away. The six, upon reaching its zenith, vanished with a sharp spang. A moment later, there was a small thunderclap. Hey, that one was silver, exclaimed Hrun, rising to his feet and staring upward. Bring it back. I don't know where it's gone, said Rincewind wearily. It's probably still accelerating. The ones I tried this morning didn't come down anyway. Hrun was still staring into the sky. What? said Two Flower. Rincewind sighed. He had been dreading this. We've strayed into a zone with a high magical index, he said. Don't ask me how. Once upon a time, a really powerful magic field must have been generated here, and we're feeling the after effects. Precisely, said a passing bush. Hrun's head jerked down. You mean this is one of those places, he asked. Let's get out of here. Right, agreed Rincewin. If we retrace our steps, we might make it. We can stop every mile or so and toss a coin. He stood up urgently and started stuffing things into his saddlebags. What? said Two Flower. Rincewind stopped. Look, he snapped. Just don't argue. Come on. It looks all right, said Two Flower. Just a bit underpopulated, that's all. Yes, said Rincewind. Odd, isn't it? Come on. There was a noise high above them, like a strip of leather being slapped on a wet rock. Something glassy and indistinct passed over Rincewind's head, throwing up a cloud of ashes from the fire, and the pig carcass took off from the spit and rocketed into the sky. It banked to avoid a clump of trees, righted itself, roared around in a tight circle, and headed hubwards leaving a trail of hot pork fat droplets. What are they doing now? asked the old man. The young woman glanced at the scrying glass. Heading rimward at speed, she reported. By the way, they've still got that box on legs. The old man chuckled, an oddly disturbing sound in the dark and dusty crypt. Sapient pearwood, he said. Remarkable. Yes, I think we will have that. Please see to it, my dear, before they go beyond your power, perhaps. Silence, or... 
Or what, Lysa, said the old man in this dim light. There was something cold about the way he was slumped in the stone chair. You killed me once already, remember? She snorted and stood up, tossing back her hair scornfully. It was red, flecked with gold. Erect, Lysa Wormbinder was entirely a magnificent sight. She was also almost naked, except for a couple of mere scraps of the lightest chainmail and riding boots of iridescent dragon hide. In one boot was thrust a riding crop, unusual in that it was as long as a spear and tipped with tiny steel barbs. My power will be quite sufficient, she said coldly. The indistinct figure appeared to nod, or at least to wobble. As you keep assuring me, he said. Lysa snorted and strode out of the hall. Her father did not bother to watch her go. One reason for this was, of course, that since he had been dead for three months, his eyes were in any case not in the best of condition. The other was that as a wizard, even a dead wizard of the 15th grade, his optic nerves had long since become attuned to seeing into levels and dimensions far removed from common reality, and were therefore somewhat inefficient at observing the merely mundane. During his life they had appeared to others to be eight-faceted and eerily insectile. Besides, since he was now suspended in the narrow space between the living world and the dark shadow world of death, he could survey the whole of causality itself. That was why, apart from mild hope that this time his wretched daughter would get herself killed, he did not devote his considerable powers to lear learning more about the three travelers galloping desperately out of his realm. Several hundred yards away, Lysa was in a strange humor as she rode down the worn steps that led into the hollow heart of the Wormberg, followed by half a dozen riders. Would this be the opportunity? Perhaps here was the key to break the deadlock, the key to the throne of the Wormberg. It was rightfully hers, of course, but tradition said that only a man could rule the Wormberg. That irked Lysa, and when she was angry the power flowed stronger and the dragons were especially big and ugly. If she had a man, things would be different. Someone who, for preference, was a big strapping lad but short on brains. Someone who would do what he was told. The biggest of the three now fleeing the Dragonlands might do, and if it turned out that he wouldn't, then dragons were always hungry and needed to be fed regularly. She could see to it that they got ugly. Uglier than usual, anyway. The stairway passed through a stone arch and ended in a narrow ledge near the roof of the great cavern where the worms roosted. Sunbeams from the myriad entrances around the walls crisscrossed the dusty gloom like amber rods in which a million golden insects had been preserved. Below, they revealed nothing but a thin haze. Above, the walking rings started so close to Lysa's head that she could reach up and touch one. They stretched away in their thousands across the upturned acres of the cavern roof. It had taken a score of masons a score of years to hammer the pittance for all those hanging from their work as they progressed. Yet they were as nothing compared to the 88 major rings that clustered near the apex of the dome. A further 50 had been lost in the old days as they were swung into place by teams of sweating slaves and there had been slaves aplenty in the first days of the power, and the great rings had gone crashing into the depths, dragging their unfortunate manipulators with them. But 88 had been installed, huge as rainbows, rusty as blood. From them... The dragon sense Lysa's presence. Air swishes around the cavern as 88 pairs of wings unfold like a complicated puzzle. Great heads with green, multifaceted eyes peer down at her. The beasts are still faintly transparent. While the men around her take their hook boots from the rack, Lysa bends her mind to the task of full visualization. Above her in the musty air, the dragons become fully visible. Bronze scales dully reflect the sunbeam shafts. Her mind throbs, but now that the power is flowing fully, she can, and barely a waver of concentration, think of other things. Now she too buckles on the hook boots and turns a graceful cartwheel to bring their hooks with a faint clang against a couple of the walking, walking rings in the ceiling. Only now it is the floor. 
The world has changed. Now she is standing on the edge of a deep bowl or crater, floored with the little rings across which the dragon riders are already strolling with a pendulum gait. In the center of the bowl, their huge mounts wait about the her among the herd. Far above are the distant rocks of the cavern floor, discolored by centuries of dragon droppings. Moving with the easy gliding movement that is second nature, Lysa set off towards her own dragon, Laelith, who turns his great horsey head toward her. His jowls are great, are greasy with pork fat. It was very enjoyable, he says in her mind. I thought I said there were to be no unaccompanied flights, she snaps. I was hungry, Lysa. Curb your hunger, soon there will be horses to eat. The rain stick in our teeth. Are there any warriors? We like warriors. Lysa swings down the mounting ladder and lands with her legs locked around Layla's leathery neck. The warrior is mine. There are a couple of others you can have. One appears to be a wizard of sorts, she adds by way of encouragement. Oh, you know how it is with wizards. Half an hour afterwards, you could do with another one, the dragon grumbles. He spreads his wings and drops. They're gaining, screamed Rincewind. He bent even lower over his horse's neck and groaned. Two Flower was trying to keep up while at the same time craning around to look at the flying beast. You don't understand, screamed the tourist above the terrible noise of the wing beats. All my life I've wanted to see dragons. From the inside, shouted Rincewind, shut up and ride. He whipped at his horse with the reins and stared at the wood ahead, trying to drag it closer by sheer will willpower. Under those trees, they'd be safe. Under those trees, no dragon could fly. He heard the clap of wings before shadows folded around him. Instinctively, he rolled in the saddle and felt the white-hot stab of pain as something sharp scored a line across his shoulders. Behind him, Hrun screamed, but it sounded more like a bellow of rage than a cry of pain. The barbarian had vaulted down into the heather and had drawn the black sword, Kring, he flourished it as one of the dragons curved in for another low pass. No bloody lizard does that to me, he roared. Rincewind leaned over and grabbed Two Flower's reins. Come on, he hissed. But the dragon, said Two Flower, entranced. Blast the... began the wizard and froze. Another dragon had peeled off from the circling dots overhead and was gliding toward them. Rincewind let go of Two Flower's horse, swore bitterly, and spurred his own mount toward the trees alone. He didn't look back at the sudden commotion behind him, and when a shadow passed over him, merely gibbered, merely gibbered weakly and tried to burrow into the horse's mane. Then, instead of the searing, piercing pain he had expected, there was a series of stinging blows as the terrified animal passed under the eaves of the wood. The wizard tried to hang on, but another low branch, stouter than the others, knocked him out of the saddle. The last thing he heard before the flashing blue lights of unconsciousness closed in was a high reptilian scream of frustration and the thrashing of talons in the treetops. When he awoke, a dragon was watching him. At least it was staring in his general direction. Rincewind groaned and tried to dig his way into the moss with his shoulder blades, then gasped as the pain hit him. Through the mist of agony and fear, he looked back at the dragon. The creature was hanging from a branch of a large dead oak tree several hundred feet away. Its bronze gold wings were tightly wrapped around its body, but the long equine head turned this way and that at the end of a remarkably prehensile neck. It was scanning the forest. It was also semi-transparent. Although the sun glinted off its scales, Rincewind could clearly make out the outlines of the branches behind it. On one of them, a man was sitting, dwarfed by the hanging reptile. He happened to be naked except for a pair of high boots, a tiny leather holdall in the region of his groin, and a high-crested helmet. He was swinging a short sword back and forth idly and stared out across the treetops into the air with the air of one carrying out a tedious and unglamorous assignment. A beetle began to crawl laboriously up Rincewind's leg. The wizard wondered how much damage a half-solid dragon could do. Would it only half kill him? He decided not to stay and find out. 
moving on heels, fingertips, and shoulder muscles, rinse when wriggled sideways until foliage masked the oak and its occupants. Then he scrambled to his feet and hard off between the trees. He had no destination in mind, no provisions, and no horse, but while he still had legs, he would run, or could run. Ferns and brambles whipped at him, but he didn't feel them at all. When he had put about a mile between him and the dragon, he stopped and collapsed against a tree, which then spoke to him. Psst, it said. Dreading what he might see, Rincewind let his gaze slide upward. It tried to fasten on innocuous bits of bark and leaf, but the scourge of curiosity forced it to leave them behind. Finally, it fixed on a black sword thrust straight through the branch above Rincewind's head. Don't just stand there, said the vo- the sword in a voice like the sound of a finger dragged across the rim of a large empty wine glass. Pull me out. What? said Rincewin, his chest still heaving. Pull me out, repeated Kring. It's either that or I'll be spending the next million years in a coal measure. Did I ever tell you about the time I was thrown into a lake up in the... What happened to the others? said Rincewin, still clutching the tree desperately. Oh, the dragons got them and the horses and that box thing. Me too, except that Hrun dropped me. What a stroke of luck for you. Well, began Rincewind. Kring ignored him. I expect you'll be in a hurry to rescue them, it added. Yes, well. So if you'll just pull me out, we can be off. Rincewind squinted up at the sword. A rescue attempt had hitherto been so far at the back of his mind that in some advanced speculations on the nature and shape of the many-dimensional multiplexity of the universe were correct, it was right at the front, but a magic sword was a valuable item, and it would be a long trek back home, wherever that was. He scrambled up the tree and inched along the branch. Kring was buried very firmly in the wood. He gripped the pommel and heaved until lights flashed in front of his eyes. "'Try again,' said the sword encouragingly. Rincewind groaned and gritted his teeth. Could be worse, said Kring. This could have been an anvil. Ah, hissed the wizard, fearing for the future of his groin. I have had a multi-dimensional existence, said the sword. Hmm? I have had many names, you know. Amazing, said Rincewind. He swayed back as the black, as the blade slid free. It felt strangely light. Back on the ground again, he decided to break the news. I really don't think rescue is a good idea, he said. I think we'd better head back to a city, you know, to raise a search party. The dragons headed hubward, said Kring. However, I suggest we start with the one in the trees over there. Sorry, but you can't leave them to their fate. Rincewin looked surprised. I can't, he said. No, you can't. Look, I'll be frank. I've worked with better material than you, but it's either that or... Have you ever spent a million years in a coal measure? Look, I... So if you don't stop arguing, I'll chop your head off. Rincewind saw his own arm snap up until the shimmering blade was humming a mere inch from his throat. He tried to force his fingers to let go. They wouldn't. I don't know how to be a hero, he shouted. I propose to teach you. Bronze Sefa rumbled deep in his throat. Kistra, the dragon rider, leaned forward and squinted across the clearing. I see him, he said. He swung himself down easily from branch to branch and landed lightly on the tussocky grass, drawing his sword. He took a long look at the approaching man, who was obviously not keen on leaving the shelter of the trees. He was armed, but the dragon rider observed with some interest the strange way in which the man held the sword in front of him at arm's length, as though embarrassed to be seen in its company. Kistra hefted his own sword and grinned expansively as the wizard shuffled toward him. Then he leapt. Later he remembered only two things about the fight. He recalled the uncanny way in which the wizard's sword curved up and caught his own blade with a shock that jerked it out of his grip. The other thing, and it was this, he averred, that led to his downfall, was that the wizard was covering his eyes with one hand. Kistra jumped back to avoid another thrust and fell full length on the turf. With a snarl, Sefa unfolded his great wings and launched himself from his tree. 
A moment later, the wizard was standing over him, shouting, Tell it that if it singes me, I'll let the sword go. I will. I'll let it go. So tell it. The tip of the black sword was hovering over Kistra's throat. What was odd was that the wizard was obviously struggling with it and appeared to be singing to itself. Sepha, Kistra shouted. The dragon roared in defiance but pulled up at the dive that would have removed Rincewind's head and flapped ponderously back to the tree. Talk, screamed Rincewind. Kistra squinted at him at the, up the length of the sword. What would you like me to say, he asked. What? I said, what would you like me to say? Where are my friends? The barbarian and the little man is what I mean. I expect they have been taken back to the Wormberg. Rincewind tugged desperately against the surge of the sword, trying to shut his mind to Kring's bloodthirsty humming. What's a Wormberg, he said. The Wormberg. There is only one. It is Dragonholm. And I suppose you were waiting to take me there, eh? Kistra yelped involuntarily as the tip of the sword pricked a bead of blood from his Adam's apple. Don't want people to know you've got dragons here, eh? snarled Rincewind. The dragon rider forgot himself enough to nod and came within a quarter inch of cutting his own throat. Rincewind looked around desperately and realized that this was something he was really going to have to go through with. Right then, he said as differently as he could manage. You better take me to this Wormberg of yours, hadn't you? I was supposed to take you in dead, muttered Kistra sullenly. Rincewind looked down at him and grinned slowly. It was a wide, manic, and utterly humorless rictus. It was the sort of grin that is normally accompanied by small riverside birds wandering in and out, picking scraps out of their teeth. Alive will do, said Rincewind. If we're talking about anyone being dead, remember whose sword is in which hand. If you kill me, nothing will prevent Sepha killing you, shouted the prone dragon rider. So what I'll do is I'll chop bits off, agreed the wizard. He tried the effect of the grin again. All right, all right said Kistra sulkily. Do you think I've got no imagination? He wriggled out from under the sword and waved at the dragon, who took wing again and glided in towards them. Rincewind swallowed. You mean we've got to go on that? he said. Kistra looked at him scornfully, the point of Kring still aimed at his neck. How else would anyone get to the Wormberg? I don't know, said Rincewind. How else? I mean, there is no other way. It's flying or nothing. Rincewind looked again at the dragon before him. He could quite clearly see through it to the crusted grass on which it lay, lay but when he gingerly touched a scale to a scale that was a mere golden sheen on thin air, it felt solid enough. Either dragons should exist completely or fail to exist at all, he felt. A dragon only half existing was worse than the extremes. I didn't know dragons could be see-through, he said. Kistra shrugged. Didn't you? he said. He swung himself astride the dragon awkwardly. Rincewind was hanging on to his belt. Once uncomfortably aboard, the wizard moved his white knuckle grip to a convenient piece of harness and prodded Kistra lightly with the sword. Have you ever flown before? said the dragon rider without looking around. Not as such, no. Would you like something to suck? Rincewing gazed at the back of the man's head, then dropped to the bag of red and yellow sweets that was being proffered. Is it necessary? he asked. It is traditional, said Kistra. Please yourself. The dragon stood up, lumbered heavily across the meadow, and fluttered into the air. Rincewind occasionally had nightmares about teetering on some intangible but enormously high place and seeing a blue distance cloud punctuated landscape reeling away below him. This usually woke him up with his ankles sweating. He would have been even more worried had he known that the nightmares was nightmare was not, as he thought, just the usual Discworld vertigo. It was a backward memory of an event in his future so terrifying that it had generated harmonics of fear all the way along his lifetime. This was not that event, but it was good practice for it. Sepha clawed its way into the air with a series of vertebrae-shattering bounds. At the top of its last leap, the wide wings unfolded with a snap and spread out with a thump which shook the trees. Then the ground was gone, dropping away in a series of gentle jerks. 
Sepha was suddenly rising gracefully, the afternoon sunlight gleaming off wings that were still no more than a golden film. Rincewind made the mistake of glancing downward and found himself looking through the dragon to the treetops below, far below. His stomach shrank at the sight. Closing his eyes wasn't much better because it gave his imagination full reign. He compromised by gazing fixedly into the middle distance, where moorland and forest drifted by and he could be con- and could be contemplated almost casually. Wind snatched at him. Kistra half turned and shouted into his ear, Behold the Wormberg! Rincewind turned his head slowly, taking care to keep Kring resting lightly on the dragon's back. His streaming eyes saw the impossibly inverted mountain rearing out of the deepest forest valley like a trumpet in a tube tub of moss. Even at this distance, he could make out the faint octoring glow in the air that must be be indicating a stable magic aura of at least, he gasped, several milliprime at least. Oh no, he said. Even looking at the ground was better than that. He averted his eyes quickly and realized that he could now no longer see the ground through the dragon. As they glided around in a wide circle toward the Wormberg, it was definitely taking on a more solid form, as if the creature's body was filling with a gold mist. By the time the Wormberg was in front of them, swinging wildly across the sky, the dragon was as real as a rock. Rincewind thought he could see a faint streak in the air, as if something from the mountain had reached out and touched the beast. He got the strange feeling that the dragon was being made more genuine. Ahead of it, the Wormberg turned from a distant toy to several billion tons of rock poised between heaven and earth. He could see small fields, woods, and a lake up there, and from the lake a river spilled out and over the edge. He made the mistake of following the thread of foaming water with his eyes and jerked himself back just in time. The flared plateau of the upturned mountain drifted towards them. The dragon didn't even slow. As the mountain loomed over Rincewind like the biggest fly swatter in the universe, he saw a cave mouth. Sepha skimmed towards it, shoulder muscles pumping. The wizard screamed as the dark spread and enfolded him. There was a brief vision of rock flashing past, blurred by speed, then the dragon was in the open again. It was inside a cave, but bigger than any cave had a right to be. The dragon, gliding across its vast emptiness, was a mere gliding fly in a banqueting hall. Gilded fly, anyway. There were other dragons, gold, silver, black, white, flapping across the sun-shafted air on errands of their own or perched on outcrops of rock. High in the domed roof of the cavern, scores of others hung from huge rings, their wings wrapped bat-like around their bodies. There were men up there, too. Rincewind swallowed hard when he saw them because they were walking on that broad expanse of ceiling like flies. Then he made out the thousands of tiny rings that studded the ceiling. A number of inverted men were watching Sepha's flight with interest. Rincewind swallowed again. For the life of him, he couldn't think of what to do next. Well, he asked in a whisper, any suggestions? Obviously you attack, said Kring scornfully. Why didn't I think of that, said Rincewind. Could it be because they all have crossbows? You're a defeatist. Defeatist? That's because I'm going to be defeated. You're your own worst enemy, Rincewind, said the sword. Rincewind looked up at grinning men. Bet, he said wearily. Before Kring could reply, Sepha reared in mid-air and alighted on one of the large rings, which rocked alarmingly. Would you like to die now or surrender first, asked Kistra calmly. Men were converging on the ring from all directions, walking in with a swaying motion as their hooked boots engaged the ceiling rings. There were more boots on a rack that hung in a small platform built on the side of the perch ring. Before Rincewind could stop him, the dragon rider had leapt from the creature's back to land on the platform, where he stood grinning at the wizard's discomfiture. There was a small expressive sound made by a number of crossbows being cocked. Rincewind looked up at a number of impassive upside-down faces. The dragon folk's taste in clothing didn't run to anything more imaginative than a leather harness, 
studded with bronze ornaments. Knives and sword sheaths were worn inverted. Those who were not wearing helmets let their hair flow freely, so that it moved like seaweed in the ventilation breeze near the roof. There were several women among them. The inversion did strange things to their anatomy. Rincewind stared. Surrender, said Kistra again. Rincewind opened his mouth to do so. Kring hummed a warning and agonizing waves of pain shot up his arm. Never, he squeaked. The pain stopped. Of course he won't, boomed an expansive voice from him. He's a hero, isn't he? Rincewind turned and looked into a pair of hairy nostrils. They belonged to a heavily built young man, hanging nonchalantly from the ceiling by his boots. What is your name, hero? said the man, so that we know who you were. Agony shot up Rincewind's arm. I, I'm Rincewind of Ankh, he managed to gasp. And I am Lord Dragonlord, said the hanging man, pronouncing the word with the harsh click at the back of the throat that Rincewind could only think is of a kind of integral punctuation. You have come to challenge me in mortal combat. Well, no, I didn't. You are mistaken. Kistra, help our hero into a pair of hook boots. I am sure he is anxious to get started. No, look, I just came here to find my friends. I'm sure there's no... Rincewind began as the dragon rider guided him firmly onto the platform, pushing him into a seat, and proceeded to strap hook boots to his feet. Hurry up, Kistra, we mustn't keep our hero from his destiny, said Liort. Look, I expect my friends are happy enough here, so if you could just, you know, set me down somewhere. You will see your friends soon enough, said the dragon lord airily. If you are religious, I mean. None who enter the Wormberg ever leave again, except metaphorically, of course. Show him how to reach the rings, Kistra. Look what you've gotten me into, Rincewind hissed. Kring vibrated in his hand. Remember that I'm a magic sword? It hummed. How can I forget? Climb the ladder and grab a ring, said the dragon rider, then bring your feet up until the hooks catch. He helped the protesting wizard climb until he was hanging upside down, robe tucked into his breeches. Kring dangled from one hand. At this angle, the dragon folk looked reasonably bearable, but the dragons themselves, hanging from their perches, loomed over the scene like immense gargoyles. Their eyes glowed with interest. Attention, please, said Liort. A dragon rider handed him a long shape wrapped in red silk. We fight to the death, he said. Yours. And I suppose I earn my freedom if I win, said Rincewind without much hope. Liort indicated the accessible dragon riders with the tilt of his head. Don't be naive, he said. Rincewind took a deep breath. I suppose I should warn you, he said, his voice hardly quavering at all, that this is a magic sword. Liort let the red silk wrapping drop away from the gloom and flourished a jet black blade. Runes glowed on its surface. What a coincidence, he said, and lunged. Rincewind went rigid with fright, but his arms swung as Kring shot forward. The swords met in an explosion of octarine light. Liort swung himself backwards, his eyes narrowing. Kring leapt past his guards. Although the Dragon Lord's sword jerked to deflect most of the force, the result was a thin red line across its master's torso. With a growl, he launched himself at the wizard, boots clattering as he slid from ring to ring. The swords met again in another violent discharge of magic, and at the same time, Liort brought his other hand down against Rincewind's head jarring him so hard that one foot jerked out of its ring and flailed desperately.